So now we're starting to look at this letter to Titus in a more consistent verse by verse way. And we got to look at this salutation of Paul's. When you write a letter, you always start it off with some kind of salutation. Uh, nowadays, I guess you don't even say dear Bob anymore, do you? It's more like email and it's hi. But back then there's a sort of protocol and etiquette that you use when you open a letter and you say who's writing it and you say who the letter is addressed to right off the bat. And what Paul does right here in Titus is that he goes way beyond what would be expected of a regular everyday letter or epistle. And this opening is one of the longest openings that he ever wrote of any of his letters. So we got many, many ideas here that are even longer and bigger than the big long sentence that he used to start this off with. So what's it all mean? And you know, when I, when I study the Bible and when you study the Bible, one thing you can do to help you get a grasp on whatever passage you're looking at is to see if you can summarize all the points in one sentence. And you know, it'll take maybe two or three or five or six times doing this as you try to fit everything in and see what you can do because it's going to be this big run-on sentence. And what I was doing was writing all these sentences that were about as long as Paul's original sentence, and that doesn't help. Because you can just write out the scripture, and you learn a little something by that, but I mean, what's he getting at, right? And I was working on it, and I decided to knock off and go to bed, and I opened my Bible and did my normal reading. And I happened to be in Numbers 24, and I read the summary to what Paul was writing to Titus. Because it says there that Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel. And I, I like that so much, I, I even put it in the bulletin so you could read it. And the point to this is that this guy Balaam was hired by the king of Moab to curse Israel, get rid of them. And God told him, don't do it. But eventually, Balaam goes with Balak, and Balak, the king of Moab, says, okay, what do you need to do? And he says, let's go up on a mountain, build seven altars, put the sacrifices on them, and then I'll go seek God. Well, every time Balaam seeks God to curse Israel, God says, don't do it. I've blessed them. So that's it. Well, the king of Moab says, let's go to another place. and Maybe the Lord will let you curse them there. So he keeps doing this, and each time God says, nope, don't curse them. They're blessed. So finally, by chapter 24, Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel. That is, there's no way to get around it. And Balaam gave up. And see, that is what Paul's long sentence here in this opening to his letter to Titus means. It means God is pleased to bless you. Let me say it again. God is pleased to bless you. That's what this big, long sentence means. And I'm going to read it. It says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, boy, when I read these big, long introductions with a lot of words, big words, and it's convoluted, 
kind of spins my head. Does it spin yours? Yes. Plus, the ancients, I'm told, were fond of being able to make very long sentences. Because I guess Greek allows you to do that. And you kind of know where you're at still at the end of the sentence. But if you do it in English, you kind of run out of breath mentally and go, I don't get it. What happened? What was that? But we're going to take it apart and see how it all adds up to this one thing, it pleases God to bless you. Now first, Paul mentions himself, because that's what you do when you're addressing a letter. And if it was the, a plain old letter with no theological information in it, it would be Paul to Titus, grace. That's what he would have said. Grace is kind of like, hi, but he expands on it. And he's, first of all, when he says Paul, then he begins to talk about who he is. Now, you think Titus would already know if he read Paul. He'd go, oh, I know. He's my boss. I work for him. I know this guy. And we get the same thing when we read that. We think, okay, Paul, why does he go on about himself? Well, I want, I want to point out two things to you. First of all, he calls himself a bondservant of God. And what that means, that's who he is before God when nobody else is looking. Now, when that happens, you don't come with God with a title and your position and your salary and your clothing and everything around you. When you come before God, it's just you and him. And none of those things define who you are before God. They define us before other people, but not before God. So when Paul is right in front of God, who he is is a bondservant. And that means the lowest form of slave. You think, well, now, what's so cool about that? Isn't that degrading? Why would you want to describe yourself as a slave? It's true that that's the lowest kind of slave. That means God is the boss. Anything God wants from me, he can have it. But then a slave status was determined by who's the master. If your master was a no-good, shifty kind of jerk, tough luck. But if your master turns out to be almighty God, that says something about who you are and who you belong to. So being a slave of God is not degrading. It's an honor and a privilege because... God treats his slaves like sons. Whereas I've noticed the devil treats his sons like slaves. Isn't that weird? So it's an honor and a privilege to be a bond servant, a slave of God. But then he also calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. And this is who Paul is towards men. This is his job. We're going to talk about what an apostle is in a minute. But you know what I said before? Yeah, it's going to keep doing that. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God, okay? Now, before other men, Paul's an apostle. That's his job. And you know, we have a tendency to identify ourselves and to measure ourselves by our job, not only just everybody in the world, but even when you are a minister, when you serve God. You have a job, you serve God, you measure yourself by how the job is. Is the job high and exalted? Does everybody go ooh and ah? Here comes professor, doctor, pastor, whatever. Or is it like, oh, it's just what's his face? 
We measure ourselves by that job, by that status. And, you know, the job might go well. The ministry might go what you would assume to be as well. But it could also go crummy. You know, uh, you might be Elijah, and he called down fire from heaven. That's pretty cool. But you might be Isaiah. And you know, they sawed Isaiah in half. So you'd think, okay, Elijah's got a better ministry, and Isaiah didn't do so good. But you know what? That's not the way to reckon how things are going. You know, even Paul, at the end of his life, he's writing to Timothy. We'll look at that in 2 Timothy. And he says, you will have heard that everyone in Asia has turned away from me. And you could say, well, this is the end of your life. You're about to get executed. And everything you've worked for has just blown up. They're not with you anymore. But you don't find Paul kind of, everything I've worked for is blown up. My life is a waste. I'm a failure. You don't catch him saying that. But here's what he does say. I know him whom I've believed in, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. So you know, what Paul is really subtly telling Titus is, remember who I am, remember who you are. Who are you before God, Titus? You're a bond slave of God. That's a great place to be. What's your job? Well, you're working with me, of course. But don't measure yourself by your job. It's who you are when you're in front of God. Now, what is an apostle? He says here, an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. There's two things that an apostle does in this situation. We're not going to go over the entire thing. To be an apostle, you had to see Jesus and be commissioned by him. And Paul saw Jesus and was commissioned to represent him. But here's two things that an apostle is supposed to do. And it's, it's with this idea towards furthering, enabling, progressing. Two things. He's supposed to further the faith of God's elect. Now, faith means you have a relationship with God. Faith means you have a relationship with anybody. To the degree that you trust somebody, to that degree, you have a relationship, right? So if, if you trust this guy with your car keys, with your passport, with your, I don't know, your Apple ID, you must have a pretty strong relationship there. And if you don't trust this person, it doesn't matter if you're right next to him. You don't have a relationship. Does that make sense? A relationship is made up of these bonds of trust. And the more bonds that you have connecting you, the better. It's kind of an invisible thing, but it's really real, isn't it? Like when you're married. It's not just a piece of paper that says you're married. It's this continual making of bonds of trust. And if you violate that trust, you damage your relationship. It doesn't matter what the paper says. So really, when we're talking about faith, we're not talking about a substance, a thing that you can look at. We're talking about a degree of relationship. And what Paul is saying here is that his job as an apostle is to further the faith of God's people. He's supposed to contribute to that so that everyone who's belonging to God, their faith will progress and grow so that the relationship with God becomes stronger, tighter, 
better. And then the other thing he's supposed to further, the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. Wow, we got to unpack this one. This word acknowledgement is a word that means full knowledge. And it's more intense than just knowing a fact. It's the difference between reading a book on swimming and actually swimming the English Channel. You read a book on swimming, you'll know the proper head position and the strokes and, you know, the theory about kicking your legs and all that business. But when you have finished swimming the English Channel and you're still alive, then you have something to talk about. You know what it's like to be in the water that long, your body gooped up with whatever they goop you up with to get through the water faster. I've seen pictures, never done it myself, but... Right? You know what kind of swimsuit to wear? Probably don't wear a Speedo. But who would you want to listen to about the fine points of swimming the English Channel? Me or the guy who's actually done it? And see, this is the kind of knowledge that Paul is supposed to further with all of God's people. It's about the truth, furthering the knowledge of the truth by experience, by being in it. Not just by reading with a book and I've ticked off my chapters for the day, done and dusted. It's actually being involved with the truth. And you know, the truth is more than just ink on a page. Truth is a person. God is the truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. So what Paul is supposed to further is this experience of knowing Jesus by experience. And part of it is the Bible, because that, that's like the lines on a tennis court. It shows us when the ball is inbounds, shows us when the ball is out of bounds. And you can't just play tennis without the lines, because you're just hitting the ball, but who's winning? I don't know. We're just running around having a good time. And a lot of people want to practice their Christianity that way. They're just running around, hitting a ball, having a good time. Are you knowing Jesus? See, this is, this is more than a business, a conglomerate, a club. This is about actually knowing God. We're not playing church. And Paul is going to further that knowledge so that God's people really know God. And he says when that happens, God's people are going to be godly. He says it's the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, which means knowing about God is not head knowledge only, but it has to affect your life. The truth is Jesus died for your sins. He took all of your condemnation upon himself. There's no condemnation for you anymore. Even if you sinned this morning, even if you know a good reason why you should go to hell this morning, because you trust in Jesus and he died for your sins, there's no more condemnation. Not one person can say a word against you to change that. That righteousness is forever. Now, how does that change your life? How does that affect your life when that truth is worked into your life to the point where you say, okay, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me 
and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Okay? If you knew that you were on death row and you were going to die tomorrow, I know they don't do that here, but even if they did, and suddenly they unlocked your door and they opened it and they said, you can walk free. Somebody else has taken your punishment and you're set free. You're done. How would you feel? Would you say, no, lock the door. I, I think I'll just stay here. I like it in prison. Prison's fun. They feed you. Would you do that? Everybody's dead here this morning. Just going, oh, I don't know, prison. I like it. If you knew you were going to die and somebody said, you can live, I think I would go, oh boy. Hey, I'm going to get me a Big Mac right now. You see, that's part of being godly. Did you know it? Part of being godly is you twig. I don't have to die. And because of that, you get to be happy. Hey, somebody just crunched your car fender. How come you're not upset? I'm going to live. A car can be fixed. I'm going to live. Do you see? That's going to touch every part of your body. That's part of being godly. And you know, if you continue to live in kind of a... Everybody's going to say, well, man, whatever you got, I hope I don't get it. You know, did you get like a permanent case of depression or what? And this is not to bang on anybody's head. I have gone through this myself where I let my problems completely blot out the existence of God, completely wipe out the fact that I'm not going to hell. And I think, you know what? I'm never going to do that again. I don't care how bad it gets here. It does not outweigh the fact that Jesus died for me and rose again from the dead. You see? Godliness. Godliness means, you know what, from here on in, I am not living for myself. I don't die for myself. I belong to the one who loved me and bought me with his own blood. That's what my life is about from here on in. And I measure my life by how's my relationship with Jesus doing? That's the deal. Now, like I say, we're not learning, you know, how to barf up a number of answers for a quiz. We're learning Jesus. That's what we're about. We're learning this person. This person who is so amazing that he loved me and died for me and rose again from the dead. Now, the furthering of faith and true, full, experiential knowledge results in eternal life. Look at that verse 2. All of this is in hope of eternal life. And we really have to understand hope. Hope means it's going to happen. It doesn't mean I wish it would. My mom can't do this anymore, but she used to give me money. And I always appreciated her for that. Whenever she'd tell me, I wrote you a check, it's on the way, I would say, why? Because I'm happy. It's on the way. Now, if somebody said to me, what makes you so happy? My mom sent me a check. Well, what makes you think you're going to get it? Well, I know my mom. If she says she's doing it, she's going to do it. Well, see, I, I, I know my mom. So when she says it's on the way, I can be happy right now. 
And what Paul is saying is, we have something that's like that, only it's mom turned up to four bazillion. God says, our hope, our expectation is eternal life, which you've got to have. It's not an option. You know, anything less than living forever is a stay of execution. doesn't matter how long you live. If you have to die at the end of it, what good is it? The only thing that matters in this life, the next life, is eternal life. Otherwise, it's eternal death. And there's nothing in between. Like, I don't choose to vote for this. Everything that we need for life is wrapped up in eternal life. For example, absolute purity. The inability to ever sin again. No more corruption. No more weakness, disease. Things go wrong. But only full glory lasting, permanent, eternal glory with God. That's eternal life. Getting to know the infinite God. We get to know glory after glory after glory. Anything other than that is just dead. Anybody without Jesus is dead right now. Now, how do you know this? People will ask you about this. How do you know this is going to happen? How do you know that you're not just deluded? How come you believe that book? How do you know this book is the real thing? Because all the other religions have their own book. And they all believe that their book is the right book. So how can you be confident because Paul talks about this. See, he's talking about God, and he says something really important about God. He says, God cannot lie. Not only that he won't tell a lie, but he can't. It has nothing to do with God, even if he wanted to. He can't do it. So if you ever want to know if there's something that God can't do, there's one of them. But that's good because there's no such thing as a good lie. Does everybody hear me? No lie is good. Every lie deceives. Every lie covers up something that's wrong. No lie can help you. And every lie only hurts you. So, when God reveals himself and speaks, that is true. And he's able to protect what he has revealed and caused to be written so that it is true. Can you imagine God, who cannot tell a lie, watching casually as somebody just kind of rips it up and burns it? Says, that's that. We're done with it. We're throwing out the Bible. We're getting rid of God. No more. You think God's going to just sit there and say, well, tumpty tum. Nice day if it don't rain. I don't care. You know, people have tried to do that systematically destroy the Bible. King Henry VIII did that. Tried to burn all of the Bibles that were being smuggled into England from William Tyndale. No, it wasn't Tyndale. Who's the other guy? Great. I'm having a great moment here. As soon as you come up with it, no, you can't come with Joni and me on the vacation. That's, 
That's too big a prize, can't do it. Come on, I'm gonna make a, a plow boy know more of the Bible than the Pope. Was that Tyndale? Okay, Tyndale. All right, Tyndale. You know, the King of England kept finding the Bibles that were being smuggled in and burning them. There's not many left, but one of them is in the British Library. And you can go there and see it in their document room next to Codex Sinaiticus and a few other things. There's a Tyndale Bible. And you know whose that was? It was his wife. She had a Tyndale Bible. And while he's busy trying to burn them and everything, she's got hers. She's not letting them have it. You see, God does stuff like that all the time. There are so many people who would love to find out that the Bible isn't true. That's what the craze for archaeology was all about. They laughed in the 1600s at all the ites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Hittites. They said, this is a bunch of hooey. Who are these people? There's no buildings. There's nothing left over from these people at all. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, this is a bunch of hooey. Well, they started finding all these artifacts. Austin Layard, French guy, actually excavated Nineveh. And you know, they haven't found one archaeological discovery that has ever contradicted the Bible. A deafening silence comes from archaeologists. No one in his right mind is going to contradict the Bible because it's going to be found out to be wrong. You see, God cannot lie. He's caused it to be written down and he protects it. So here's a reason why we can be confident about eternal life is because God cannot lie. But he did something more than just speak truth. In verse 2, he says he promised. He promised. Now, you know, in the Bible, we're told let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't make promises because you may not be able to keep it. But this is what the writer to the Hebrews says in that fearsome chapter of Hebrews, chapter 6. Along with the crazy, scary stuff, he also writes something that's really important. He says, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. In other words, did you do this? This is what my mother used to face me with when I was a kid. And she would come up and say, did you do this? And I said, no. And then she would whip out the oath. Listen, God strike you dead. Did you do that? No, mom, God strike me dead. I didn't do it. An oath is an end of all dispute. Okay, kid, I believe you because you're still alive. <laughs> Listen, you don't take that oath in vain. You, you say, okay, 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 I did it. But that particular time, I didn't do it. God strike me dead, mom, didn't do it. That's what this writer means. Now, he says, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable, unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. God could have said, look, everybody who believes on Jesus will receive eternal life. But then he promised it. 
he confirmed it by oath. And this means there wasn't anybody to, greater to swear by. He couldn't say, well, I swear by Molech or I swear by Baal. They're penny ante gods. He says, I swear by myself that in doing this, I will make this promise firm, sure. That means if God doesn't keep his promise, he won't exist, which is not going to be. And it comes down to this. Either every single word in the Bible is true or it's a complete and utter lie. That's all. Now, the difference is, is when you actually experience it. Just like swimming the English Channel. Nobody can ever tell you, well, you didn't swim the Channel. Get out of here. You have a conflict of, of opinion, but you know what? If you actually swam it, that's it. There's nothing they can say. And here's the wonderful thing about the promise of God. The one who believes in Jesus, receives him, is born again and knows what it means to have that weight of sin removed. That person knows what it's like to have a clean conscience, to be able to go to sleep at night and not have it nag and worry and scratch and say, you know what? You can never forget this. You did it. But this promise of eternal life can actually give a person a clean conscience, a new life, and a power to live godly. To no longer be a slave of sin. Slave of corruption. A slave of the devil. You receive this and it is an experience and you even see the power of it in your own life. We actually turn around and you take those things that you were slave to and you grind them to powder. And you throw it out and you burn it. Just like all those wannabe sorcerers did in Ephesus. They got all their magic scrolls together and they put them in a pile in the city and they burned them. And the amount of it ran into thousands, tens of thousands and they burned it with their own hands. And they said, this is what I used to do, and I'm not going to do it anymore. And that takes power. The power of a, an endless life. And so, God spoke these things. He promised them. Now, when he promised is really the clincher. Notice. He promised before time began. And when did God choose his people? It says here, the faith of God's elect. When did God choose his people? The answer is in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, he chose us in him, that is in Jesus, before the foundation of the world. Now, these things happened before God made everything and time. God promised about salvation and he chose his people before anything had happened. You think, okay, now, what's the value of that? Well, it means that God's purpose is eternal. It means that his promise is eternal. It means God's love for you is eternal. It means it cannot change. Nothing can happen to it. He'll never unmake that promise. Say, oh, well, I promised, but then you're such a record stinker. I'm going to change my mind in your case. I'll save everybody else, but you're out of here. Nope. He knew everything in advance. 
Now, some people say, well, that's not fair because am I chosen? The answer is, I don't know. Why don't you receive Jesus? Well, I don't want to. Well, then maybe you're not chosen. Well, that's not fair. Well, you can always receive Jesus. Then you'll be chosen. See, nothing to stop you from doing that. But when you receive Jesus, you find out you are chosen. Now, here's, here's in my mind what's really interesting about this. This is God's eternal purpose to save everyone who receives Jesus, give them eternal life. There's a lot of opposition to this. Have you noticed? You receive Jesus and all of a sudden you find out this isn't easy. You find the devil grinding you. There's only one explanation. It's not just you keep having these bad days. There's opposition. You have this temptation to be depressed, oppressed, and think about everything that's going wrong and think, oh, I'm such a lousy Christian. I'm such a failure. And it just grinds on you all the time. You can't just be a Christian and everybody slap you on the back and say, well, good for you, man. You're a weirdo, but Whatever, whatever floats your boat. <clears throat> no, they don't like you. All this pressure and opposition. And then, you know, your own failures. Sometimes you think, well, I would make it to heaven, but I'm such a jerk. How am I going to make it? But you know, everything that's an obstacle, that's an oppression, or that opposes, all of those things are temporary. Everything, even the devil, temporary. But God, his promise, his love, his enabling is forever. Which means everyone who receives Jesus is going to make it. We are going to outlast the universe all of our enemies, they're all going to be, used to be, but no more. In fact, we just studied this in Isaiah, what you're missing if you don't come out. He says, you're going to look for all of your enemies and you're not going to find them anymore. They're going to be like a non-existent thing. So, we're talking about confidence. And then, all this happened before time began, but then in due time, God manifested his word through preaching. All of this eternal promise is being fulfilled right now in history. That's the interesting thing to me, is this isn't potential, like someday it's going to happen. But God has already sent his son. His son has already died for our sins and risen from the dead. He has already poured forth the Holy Spirit given to everyone who receives Jesus. It's not someday, it's now, just like that phone. Wants to get a hold of you right now. Well, guess what? God is saying, right now, this is all a reality. And we love everybody. It's okay. Don't worry about it. And God, who cannot lie, commanded Paul to preach this. Now, this is the, the, the next link in the whole thing. You see, the God who cannot lie appeared to Paul, who at that time was against God. Didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He was out to persecute him. And he says, okay, now you're working for me. And Paul turns completely around and starts preaching that Jesus is the Son of God, died for our sins, and rose again from the dead. How can he do this? What's his authority? How come he's, he's not crazy? It's because God, who cannot lie, appeared to him and said, I want you to do this. 
Now, if God appeared to you and said, hey, I want you to do this, would you do it? I mean, if it was, you know, seven times brighter than the sun, and he says, you're persecuting me. Well, I think I'll stop. I want you to work for me. Yes, Lord. That's what Paul is doing. So that is who Paul is, what he's about. And then verse four, to Titus. We'll leave it at that. But think about this this morning. Who are you really when you're before God? Do you have a relationship with him? Or do you have no relationship with him? You know what? That is what you glory in. And if you haven't got a relationship with God, that's what you need. Forget everything else. Forget the job, the money, the essential other, the trip to Rio, all that junk. You don't need that. But what you really need is that relationship with God because that's who you really are. And then you know, Paul is writing this and the entire Bible is written so that you can progress in your faith. So that you can really know God by experience. That's why you need to be in your Bible. If you don't do this, you're not going to progress. And God wants you to, and that's why he wrote it. Does that make sense? This is the thing right here. This Bible is how you experience God practically. But then here's something to really thank God about. Think about all the stuff in your life that's difficult and hard. And you have to keep living with it and it looks like it's never going to go away. You know, just like it's, it's here to live with you forever and you can never get away from it. It's always going to be punching you in the side and grabbing your hair and kind of poking in your eye and just saying, hey, you have to live with me. You know, we're going to outlast all of that stuff. This is a reason to keep going, to fight back against depression and oppression and things that just drag you down where you say, you know what? So what? Because you're going to outlast the planet, the moon, the stars, all of anything that opposes you, you will outlast your health issues. You will outlive them. And whatever else is getting you down. Realize you will outlive them. That's something to be happy about every day. And if you find yourself getting down because of, ah, oh, gee, taxes. Well, let's compare that with eternal life for just a minute. Is it worthy to be compared? You know, someday, no more taxes. Let's see that day afar off and welcome it gladly. And everything else that is really just that, it just makes the ride no fun. Well, you know what? Who cares? God has promised and he cannot lie. Two unchangeable things by which we may have strong consolation. Do you have strong consolation this morning? Decide to do it. Let's pray. We want to thank you this morning, Lord. Thank you that you cannot lie. That every word that you speak is true. Thank you, Lord, for peace. Thank you for cleansing. Thank you that we can look ahead to the future without dread, without being scared of dying. 
because the first thing we see will be you. And we're going to be more alive than we've ever been, ever. Thank you for this strong hope. And we thank you, Lord, that our lives are not in vain. Thank you that there's an eternal purpose in our lives and the power to overcome everything that is just temporary. Thank you for that. We ask this morning that you would enable us to live to please you in every respect. And where we fall short, we ask you to cleanse and enable. So we commit ourselves to you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this eternal life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind.